Can I remind everybody to please scan this uh, paper on the table? It, uh, it's not only used for CME, it's also used to track attendance and uh, help us uh, provide the meals and, uh, and these great talks. So I uh, would really appreciate it if you scan it, even if you're a medical student or resident and not planning on claiming credit. Uh, Today it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Alex Bully. Dr. Bully joined us uh, here at ETSU Pediatrics three years ago uh, from uh, Lake Erie College of Osteopathic Medicine. Uh, she's leaving us to practice general pediatrics at the northernmost point in the United States, Wasilla, Alaska, <laughs> mm -hmm. or thereabouts. Uh, Dr. Bully's has numerous advocacy projects and research projects, including some GI work with pinworms causing B12 deficiency, which I don't even want to think about. <laughs> Today she's going to talk about a more pleasant topic, uh, introducing complementary foods to infants. Uh, so I'll turn it over to her. Thanks, guys. So the name of my presentation is Bon Appetit Baby, the art and science of introducing complementary foods. And So disclosures, I have no disclosures. So my inspiration, I think most of you guys probably know him by now if you've met me at all. This is Simon, my three month old little boy that will be working on introducing foods here quickly. So um, this was definitely an inspiration for me along with all the patients um, that we see, especially at those two and four month visits that you can have really fun conversations with families about, including as they get a little bit older in nine months and a year as well. So the objectives for my presentation, we are going to work on identifying developmental skills required for introduction of complementary foods. I apologize, there's gonna be a lot of pictures of my son in this presentation. Um, discuss the optimal timing of introduction of complementary foods. Suggest first foods in order of introduction. No appropriate recommendations for introduction of highly allergenic foods. No appropriate recommendation, or discuss foods to avoid with families. Discuss mineral and vitamin deficiencies, specifically iron, uh, fluoride, vitamin D, and also zinc as well. Discuss with parents some home preparations of foods and encourage families to create an appropriate feeding environment. So first, talking about developmental skills. So this is gonna be one of those things that parents should be able to see these cues, but just helping guide, especially in the premature infant, if they're a little bit behind on these developmental milestones, what we'll be looking for. So we, of course, wanna see these kids sitting with support and having good head and neck control. So being able to sit in a high chair for us to be able to start introducing some of these foods. Um, having adequate trunkal control, so being able to push up from the prone position with straight elbows which my little guy's not there yet. Um, extrusion reflex um, being gone, which the extrusion reflex usually happens at about four to five months. It starts to go away by, and this reflex actually causes the tongue to raise um, to the top of the mouth, which makes it really difficult to feed these kids and makes it frustrating for both the infant and for mom as well. Um, kids should start exploring textures, so bringing things to their mouth, um, different chew kind of toys, bringing their hands to their mouth, that sort of stuff to start showing that they're ready and start having a desire for food as well. Um, so usually opening their mouth, leaning forward, um, and then also being able to lean back and turn away whenever they're full and they're done with food. So this usually happens about five to six months of age. So what's the optimal timing? So based on those developmental milestones, like we've already hinted at, we tend to fall in that four to six month range, but of course this is different if we're talking about premature infants as well. Um, so the AAP in the WHO has the suggestion of doing exclusive breastfeeding for at least the first six months. And this was based on a large Cochrane Review study um, in 11 developing countries and 12 developed nations that showed that there was a decrease in GI infection if we stuck to exclusive breastfeeding for the first six months. So why don't we wanna do any earlier introduction? So early introduction is what we think about being less than four months of age. And there was an interesting kind of study or was passed around kind of the mom blogs that it would help your kids sleep if you added um, foods to their diet a little bit sooner. So I don't know, any of you remember the zero to three month stage, but any extra sleep for a parent is really nice. Um, so that would kind of encourage them, but they did do a study in the United Kingdom that found that parents that were actually eat, adding a tablespoon per ounce at just five weeks of age versus four months, there was no longer sleep for those kids. Um, and they didn't see a peak of sleep until six months of age, which we would expect to see anyway. 
Um, we, of course, worry about them aspirating when they're younger than four months because they're not quite meeting those developmental milestones. We can also worry about inadequate or giving them too much calories um, and increasing their solid, renal solute load, which they're not quite ready for. Um, there's been some studies that show there might be an increased risk of obesity. We're still working on some of those, though, so staying tuned with, um, for that. And then an interesting thing is we, there was one study that showed increased risk of development of islet cell antibodies, which has a role in type 1 diabetes. And there was a study that showed that kids that were introduced foods um, at less than three months of age had increased risk of development of these islet cell antibodies if they were at highest risk. So these were those that had either first degree relatives with type 1 diabetes or had a high risk HLA genotype. Um, so that was just an interesting kind of thing. Also, we don't want to introduce too early. So then why do we want to introduce around that four to six months age and not go later than that. So once we start getting at the six month age, we start to not be able to supply all the calories we need from breast milk or formula alone. So we really need some sort of other energy source. We also worry about iron def deficiency, especially in those that are breastfed, and we'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, and we can also see delayed oral motor function um, and starting to see some aversions to solid foods if we wait too long to introduce them. So there was actually a study done in 1991 and 92 using data from just self-completion questionnaires with kids. Um, and it showed that those kids that were introduced lumpier foods um, later than 10 months or older later had more distinct likes and dislikes and were more, had more aversions to foods. Um, and we also worry about the development of atopic disease, which we'll talk a lot about later, and then also type 1 diabetes. So just like early introduction, less than four months, actually introducing later, seven months and beyond, we can see those high-risk kids also having more islet cell antibodies as well. So what do we want to feed our kids when we're first introducing them? Um, so we've met all developmental milestones, now we want to start. So the AAP Committee on Nutrition suggests cer cereals and pureed meats being first. And this is to offer um, the zinc and the iron that the breast milk is becoming now deficient in. Um, and then at least having at least one feed that has vitamin C, and like we know from like our hemonc rotations, to help with absorption of that iron, vitamin C really helps. And then not restricting fat and cholesterol, and then not adding any sugar and salt. And this may seem like a little bit of a no-brainer to tell them not to add sugar and salt, but you'll have a lot of questions from families um, about adding different things because they enjoy them. So I've had the question of adding Nesquik to breast milk or pureeing pizza. So those aren't things we typically want to encourage in our kids, um, but they are questions that could come up if you don't bring up that you don't want to add sugar or salt. Um, so our first food, as long as they don't have FPIs, is going to be cereal. Um, and rice cereal is typically going to be introduced first um, because it is the least allergenic. However, we have started to see that there is higher levels of arsenic in infant rice cereal, and it's a concern because infants tend to eat three times the amount of rice cereal that, or rice that adults eat in relation to their body weight. Um, and more than half of infant rice cereals meet or near the 100 parts per million or per billion for arsenic, and we're starting to try to get cereal companies to cut down that amount. Um, but there is also arsenic and other things like bottled waters and apple juice as well that we have to think about. Um, and we worry about arsenic because it, it has been linked to skin, lung, liver, kidney, and bladder cancer. And so if we're exposing these kids earlier to rice cereals that might have arsenic in them, it might become a, a problem later on. And also thinking about this, if we do have kids we're thickening um, formula for, for GERD or other things, um, using oatmeal instead of the rice cereal. And you do have other options. You can do oat, barley, and multigrain as well. Um, we do want to encourage families to use a spoon to help with that oral motor function, so not putting it directly in the bottle, even though it's a little bit easier to do that for sure. Um, and that's because we're going to increase the caloric density if we do put it in the bottle, and we're also going to confuse some of the signals we have for hunger and for thirst. Um, and when we're preparing this, you can put it in just plain water, formula, or breast milk. Um, and we initially want to start with about a teaspoon at the end of a breast or a bottle feeding um, to see how they do and then meet a goal of about half a cup per day by six to eight months. 
So next, once we've kind of accomplished that, we want to start introducing some pureed foods. And you want to start with the single ingredients first to make sure we don't have any reactions to those foods. And the AAP actually suggests starting with meats for iron consideration, which I think a, I, don't, I, haven't, I haven't met a family yet that has started with a meat as their first food. Um, and then by 8 to 12 months, we do want to offer fruits and vegetables at least once daily. And the key is being variety. So there's been some really great studies through the AAP, one of them the infant and feeding practice study two, which showed that consumption of fruits and vegetables less than once per day during infancy was associated with infrequent, infrequent intake of fruits and vegetables at six years of age. So starting with that variety really early on, so that way we can hopefully encourage families that as they get older, they'll actually have some um, want to eat those fruits and vegetables instead of it always being a fight. Um, also, acceptability of new foods increases with repeated exposure. I know some of our outpatient docs especially say babies cannot dislike something until they've tried it. X amount of times, 15 times. Um, so giving them a little bit of break if they don't like it and then re trying to reintroduce that food a couple of days later to um, hope for acceptability of those foods. And in that same study, it showed that offering a vegetable that was disliked initially um, at eight subsequent meals was associated with an increased risk of, a, of acceptance of that vegetable and then continuing to eat it and like it at six years of age. So if you give up on broccoli right away, you can't expect your six-year-old to like broccoli too. Um, and then breastfeeding may actually help with acceptance of new foods because of the variety of flavors. So breast milk is just a little bit more dynamic of a fluid than formula is. So once again, encouraging your families with breastfeeding like we always do anyway. So then how do we move on with advancing feeds? So like everything in pediatrics, we want to follow development. Um, so by about eight months of age, infants can handle thicker purees. They can chew and swallow lumpier foods. So we want to make sure we're not sticking to those stage one foods, that we're pushing them to kind of eat lumpier things so that way they're able to control it later on. Um, starting to do some finger foods at eight to ten months. So once we have that ability to sit up by ourselves, we have a nice pincer grasp. Um, we have eye-hand coordination, we can chew and swallow, um, all that good stuff. We want to encourage them to actually feed themselves, which is also another sometimes frustrating thing for families to do, but actually letting them do that. Um, and then also starting to do more foods that you're eating as well, so finally chopping the soft foods as well. Um, and then, like I mentioned, we definitely want to encourage self-feeding. So our goal by 9 to 12 months is to be able to drink from a standard cup. I have yet to meet that child. but. Um, you know, encouraging that for families, even though it will be a mess, and then um, using having more family foods and just cutting it to the size for the child and making it safe for them. Okay, so let's move on to talking about some highly allergenic foods. So this is an exciting area that's actually changed in the last few years. Um, and it's all kind of been started by the LEAP trial. I know the residents have been introduced to this, I think, a couple of times this month so far. So this is learning early about peanut allergy. And it was a randomized controlled trial study in the United Kingdom from 2006 to 2009. And the participants were 4 to 11 month olds with severe eczema and or egg allergy. And egg allergy was described as having a skin prick test with a wheel diameter of greater than six millimeters from exposure to raw hen's egg, white, and no history of previous egg tolerance, or having a skin prick test with a wheel of greater than three millimeters from exposure to pasteurized hen's egg white and allergic symptoms after being exposed to hen's egg. And then severe eczema um, was described as requiring topical creams, ointments, or both containing steroids or calcineurin inhibitors um, for at least, for kids that were at least under six months of age and needed it for at least 12 to 30 days on at least two occasions as well. So very specific uh, sample size here. So the results of this study, so they took these two groups and at each visit they would do skin prick testing for peanuts um, and based on those two they were averaged the wheel. And if they were between one and two millimeters, they were associated with a specific IgA, IgE production, um, which is considered early sensitization to peanuts. And then they would also test IgE, IgG, and Ig4 antibodies at each visit as well. And if at the beginning of the study they started with a negative skin prick test um, after exposure to um, peanuts, they saw that 
those that completely avoided it had 13.7% allergy versus those that consumed it were only at 1.9%. And we considered this primary prevention or those who were pre before the study not sensitized to peanuts, it was protective for them. Um, and then those that started out with a skin prick test being positive, those that avoided peanuts altogether had a 35.3% risk of developing peanut allergy versus the consumption group was down to just 10.6%. And we considered the secondary prevention or um, providing a protective effect for those that were already sensitized to peanuts. Um, and another interesting they, thing they did in this study was they just looked at the dust samples um, for peanuts in both of the families just to have it as a baseline for adherence. So we expected um, more peanut dust in those kids that were exposed to the peanuts. Um, and so this study did, was a little bit limited because it didn't include low-risk infants or our general population. It was only those with eczema or with egg allergy. Um, so there went on to be two subsequent studies afterwards um, that LEAP really kind of pushed, pushed more people to get interested in this. Um, and the first one was the two-step egg introduction for prevention of egg allergy in high-risk infants with eczema or the petite. A randomized double-blind placebo controlled trial and they took infants four to five months old once again with eczema um, and then they excluded them if they had previous egg ingestion allergic reaction to egg or severe illness um, and then they would either introduce so if they were introduced the egg they would be given orally initially 50 milligrams of heated egg powder per day from six months to nine months and then moved up to 250 mm -hmm. milligrams there afterwards. Um, and during the course of the study, they, their eczema would be treated aggressively. Um, and then at 12 months of age, they did an open oral food challenge with egg. Um, and it showed that those that were exposed to egg had a decreased risk of egg allergy by 79%. And this was just published in 2016. So this is all really new data, which is exciting and fun. So then, <clears throat> Another study was done, inquiry about tolerance or eat, and this started to actually look at our um, normal infant, or not normal infants, but those that didn't have eczema or allergy at the get-go. Um, and this was a study that was done in the United Kingdom, and they wanted to target breastfed infants. So these were breastfed infants, though. Um, and so it took 1,303 breastfed infants and stratified them into a standard introduction group, which the standard introduction was exclusive breastfeeding for six months, and then basically the discretion of the family, they could choose when to introduce whatever foods they wanted to with whatever allergic potential um, the foods had. And then the other group was early introduction group, and they in underwent baseline skin prick testing and if positive, they were given an oral food challenge of two grams of protein of that food, and we'll talk a little bit about what, what foods they um, were given. And then they were to, told to consume at least five of the foods for at least five weeks between three and six months of age um, at at least 75% of the recommended dose. So we'll get into those. So these were our options. They actually looked at all the really highly allergenic foods. Um, so they had to try to incorporate peanut, at least three teaspoons of smooth peanut butter into the diet, um, egg, cow's milk, white fish, sesame, and wheat. And you can see kind of what they recommended doing for all of those. Um, so when we look at, look back at, look back at this, you can see that the actual testing results dropped from 561 in the intention to treat to down to 208. And the biggest thing was it was hard for families to incorporate all these foods. Um, so it definitely broke it down a little bit more there. So reporting, this was based on some online questionnaires and every month um, up to a year of age and then every three months once up to three years of age. And the parents in the early introduction group were given a weekly diary to help record these six allergens the best they could. Um, and then in both groups, the peanut protein levels, just like in the LEAP study, were looked at in the dust samples just to see if we were actually adhering to, just having some sort of baseline of whether or not we were adhering to actually introducing these foods. Um, and so the results you can see on the bottom, so about 5.5% were allergic to egg in the standard introduction group versus the 1.4% which were allergic to egg in the early introduction group. And then 7.3% um, had allergy to at least one of the foods at 12 months old versus 2.4% um, in the early introduction group. So what do we tell these patients then? So what are we actually going to take out of these three studies? So the latest recommendations, so if you have a child that has severe eczema and or egg allergy, we want to encourage them, can you guys see that at all? I don't know if you can. 
okay, we'll, we'll, we'll talk it through. Um, so if we have severe eczema or we have egg allergy, we want to introduce peanut as early as possible, so in that four to six months age, following successful feeding of other foods. So we want to know that they can first handle complementary foods before we start introducing peanut, so it shouldn't be your very first food. Um, and then you can kind of stratify it based on what resources you have. So one really nice thing is that you can actually do, instead of skin prick testing, which you might not have available, most people probably don't have available in their office, you can do um, blood testing for peanut specific IgE. And then based on that, you can kind of stratify your risk. So um, if based on that blood testing, we have less than 0.35, they have a greater than 90% it's likely greater than 90% of the time the skin prick test is going to be negative on them. So you can go ahead and tell them you can introduce peanuts either at home or if they feel more comfortable doing it in your office. Um, and then if the, the testing comes back and it is greater than 0.35, we say let's go ahead and refer you over to an allergist to get the specific skin prick testing. And then once we've gotten skin prick testing, if we're between zero and two millimeters, the reaction um, is your reaction to peanut is likely to be less than 95%. So once again, you can tell them either go home and try your peanuts or let's try it in the office. Um, and that's kind of just feeling out your patient and what they want to do. And then if it's between three and seven millimeters, um, that skin prick test wheel, then we can see a very high, very variable, the reaction to peanuts. So we do want to go ahead and do a supervised um, oral food challenge in the office or do graded oral food challenges. So starting with a much less amount and then working your way up. And then if it's greater than eight millimeters, just kind of, you're probably allergic to peanut. They say refer to your allergist, they can decide, but I would say just avoid peanuts. Um, does that make sense? Okay. So what if we just have mild to moderate eczema, which I think a lot of our kids follow, fall into. Um, and if we're in that, that range, we can just go ahead and say around six months of age, per the family preference, you can go ahead and introduce these at home once we've, of course, been able to tolerate other, or other complementary foods as well. And then if we don't have eczema or food allergy, we can just introduce it freely into the diet however you want. Um, so we don't have to fall between that four to 11 months, which is ideal for those other kiddos. So one thing I just wanted to kind of show you guys so you've seen it and if a parent asks about it, this was actually brought to my attention because I did the baby box um, when I had my child and then this was emailed to me. So I had no idea this was out until it was emailed to me and it's called Ready, Set, Food. Um, and it actually takes these little packets um, and they introduce three of the highly allergenic foods, so milk being the first one, then egg, then peanut, and tiny amounts that you actually add to the bottle. So this is like a little packet you add to either a bottle or if you're doing like oatmeal and breast milk, you can mix it in there. Um, and it has gradations, so you start the first four days, it works up on milk, then the next four days, it keeps the milk in there, adds egg in there, and then the last days, it does peanuts. Um, and so far the studies are looking pretty good for this. They haven't reported any like highly allergic reactions just because they start with really, really low doses. But this is op an option if families bring it up. It is very expensive though. So it's about $33 a month if you want to add that onto everything else that's up to you. Um, and they do recommend doing it up to a year of age. So once you've kind of worked up on the gradations, then staying at that max grade for, for the next year. So that is available if parents bring it up. So what are other options to introduce peanut if we don't want to go the weird powder and milk route? Um, so you can do smooth peanut butter mixed with milk or with mashed or pureed foods, which is usually how I kind of talk about families introducing, introducing it. You can do the Bomba snacks, which is what the LEAP study used. They're kind of like a puff. Um, Candy's shaking her head, yes. Have you had Bomba snacks before? Oh, okay, um, you can get you can get them on Amazon, so it is they're not sold reg regularly in, in in our stores, but you can get Bomba snacks online if you do want to introduce peanuts in that fashion, um, and then you can do a peanut soup. So if that's what you normally make at home, you can introduce kids kids that way, or you can just do finely ground peanuts um, and other foods, yogurt, however else you want to do it, um, and then of course just making sure we're not actually giving peanuts to children because that is a choking hazard until they're four years of age. Um, so you would just, just mention it to the family. 
Um, and then I just wanted to have, just say a word about gluten and celiac disease. So unfortunately, it doesn't seem like there is a critical window for introducing gluten like there is with some of these other highly allergenic foods. Um, breastfeeding does not seem to be productive or protective or cause. So there was one study I was looking at that they were saying breastfeeding might actually put you at higher risk of celiac disease and they're saying, no, not really. Um, and then it seems like the biggest thing is gonna be genetic factors. So just kind of stay in tune on, on celiac disease and the introduction of gluten. But as of right now, you can introduce it kind of freely into the diet, just not doing um, large quantities of it, which we'll see at the, at the very end. We'll talk a little bit about it. So our foods to avoid. So this, once again, seems like a no-brainer, I think, to mo most of us, but it is something important to mention to families. Um, so children younger than one, we don't want to be giving them any hard, round foods. So nuts, grapes, raw carrots, candy, that sort of stuff. Honey, we, of course, don't want to do in kids that are under one um, because of the risk of botulism. Cow's milk, we don't want to do because it can increase the renal solute load and increase our risk of iron deficiency as well. Once again, not adding sugar or salt and then the big thing is fruit juice so um, a lot of families are still getting fruit juice through WIC and things like that so talking about fruit juice um, with families and there was a study a similar one we were talking about earlier the infant feeding practices study two that consumption of sugar sweetened beverages during infancy was associated with an increased risk of obesity at six years of age so if we can kind of just squash the juice right away before it would even be introduced um, it usually helps, and then of course it increases our risk of dental caries as well. So now let's talk about some special vitamin um, considerations. So the first thousand days is a really cool website and um, document that came out, and it looks at conception to two years of age, kind of making sure that we provide um, nutrients that we need for critical brain development, um, and realizing that if we don't have the certain things um, such as zinc and iron that it can provide lifelong deficits even if we replete these later in life. So the key nutrients we worry about um, you can see here is protein, zinc, iron, choline, folate, vitamin A, D, B6, and B12, and long chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. Um, we won't talk about all of these but just having those in mind and this is a really great website if you're looking for anything for advocacy as well. They meet a lot with soup kitchens, the WIC program as well to try to encourage um, being able to supply these nutrients to kids um, and having that available. So the first one we talk about is iron. Um, so first of all, just thinking about the requirements that we need. Full-term infants need about one milligram per kilogram per day, and our preterm or low birth weight need about two to four milligrams per kilogram per day. So breastfed infants, so of course we're encouraging all our families to breastfeed, but after about four months of breastfeeding, the iron, iron requirement exceeds that um, in the breast milk and the supply that the baby had at the last tri during the last trimester. Um, and so if they're getting at least half their feeds from breast milk, we want to start thinking about supplementing in one form or another. So you have a couple of different options. So um, we can start with our complementary foods if they're developmentally appropriate for that. So start talking about um, supplying meats, doing the iron fortified cereals and the iron rich vegetables as well or actually supplementing with liquid iron as well. So um, I don't know how many people have done that in the clinic for these exclusively fed at four months, but definitely thinking about these things. And then once we're at seven to 12 months of age, we should be getting about 11 milligrams per day, which is equivalent to two servings or half a cup of dry cereal with breast milk um, should be sufficient to get that requirement. Um, so just making sure our kids, especially our premature kids, are meeting these requirements. Formula fed kids, so if they are on an iron fortified formula, which most of them are not, um, they don't need any additional, but most of the standard formulas now have at least 6.7 milligrams per liter of iron, which should be sufficient for these kids, um, as long as they're drinking a liter of milk a day, which the first couple of months, they're not quite gonna be there. Um, next, low birth weight in preterm infants. So they're gonna be depleted much earlier, so about two to three months of age. So we should start thinking about um, doing iron supplementation for these kids if they're breastfed um, by a month of life. So a lot of our preterm kids aren't breastfed, but if they are, if they're one of those lucky groups, definitely making sure that we're supplying that until their complementary foods can take over. So you guys can't really see this either, but I did wanna just kinda show, and there's lots of ways you can kind of quickly Google this whenever you have a family to um, kind of encourage them to have 
to know how much iron they're actually giving their kid. So of course the meats are gonna be the best, which are on top, um, but if you do have families that are vegetarian or you know, have, don't like to do the meats or they say their kid doesn't like it, that sort of stuff, um, you know, reaching for the things like green beans and, and peas that are higher on that list. Um, and then the cereals are of course great because they are the iron fortified, so making sure they are iron fortified. Um, and then table foods are an option too, so I don't know who eats clams on a regular basis, but those are really rich in iron if you want to give that to your child. Um, and like we, like we talked about too, we want to make sure we have a source of vitamin C to help um, with the absorption of iron too. So these are much easier to come by and much more palatable than some of the other stuff for the iron sources. But if you can kind of get families to pair these together, it can kind of help with that requirement. So why do we care so much about, about iron? So of course the end point is anemia, which I think all of us know, but the onset of non-heme tissue effects of iron deficiency predates that of anemia, just because the body is going to prioritize iron for heme synthesis. So um, if we have inadequate in the diet, we're gonna be losing our stores in the liver and everywhere else, which can start um, depleting our iron-containing cellular proteins. So we care because it produces clinical symptoms, so weakness, muscle fatigue, abnormal GI motility, and the biggest concern we're seeing is the permanent reduction um, of cognitive ability. And, and also in our kids, we can see breath holding spells, things like that, um, which sometimes we'll see when we're severely anemic. So, Right now in the United States, we are recommending doing a screening between 9 to 12 months. I think we do a really great job with that in our clinic um, just to make sure we are picking up these kids that are iron deficient. But of course, that'll be once they're at the end point, which is anemia. So um, big things is looking at risk factors. So we might want to screen them a little bit earlier than the 12 month. So going more towards the 9 month if and this would require asking you know, the family these questions, whether or not mom was iron, deficiency during, iron deficient during the pregnancy, whether the baby was premature, if the baby was given erythropoietin um, because of anemia or prematurity, and then if there was any perinatal hemorrhagic events, so like twin-twin transfusion, that sort of thing. Um, and then the big thing I think we know a lot more about is the dietary risk factors, so um, not supplementing iron in babies that are exclusively breastfed after four months of age, using low iron infant formulas, which we don't really have to worry about anymore, um, just because we are at least using the standard iron. Um, feeding of unmodified cow's milk, goat's milk, or soy milk. So every once in a while, families will start these things before the 12 month. Um, so making sure we're asking those questions. And then if we're having insufficient iron-rich complementary foods. So I think that happens a lot more often than we maybe think about it because we're just eating all the good fruits and vegetables and not pushing those meats. Um, and then if we start talking about later on, once they're one to 12 years old, um, excessive intake of cow's milk and insufficient foods. Um, we usually see that at least once or twice a year, a kid that's severely, severely anemic from just drinking cow's milk. So um, those are things that we will, we will see and making sure you're screening for those and catching them while they're in the clinic before they need to be transfused in our hospital. So next, let's switch over to talking about a little bit about vitamin D. I think we also do a really good job with this, and most of us know our requirement um, of the 400 international units um, for anyone who is exclusively breastfed. Um, and then we don't have to worry about supplementation in formula-fed baby once they take a liter per day or about 33 ounces. So that'll be a little bit later. They're initially not going to be taking that much. Um, premature infants are at increased risk, so just making sure to assess for that. Um, and an interesting study showed that only 36% of providers are actually suggesting to do this in exclusively breastfed infants. So I say go us because we're, we're definitely doing that. Um, and then another interesting sh study showed that providing supplementation of 6,400 IUs per day to the lactating mom may be comparable in actually transferring that to baby. It's not a recommendation yet, but looking out for that in the future because we have a lot of moms that talk about vitamin D just being way too hard to give to babies. Um, so maybe in the future that'll be an option. After a year of age, we do want them to have at least 600 international units, and we get about 100 um, per cup of fortified milk or orange juice. And then we can, of course, have 10 to 15 minutes of sunlight, which that kind of con conflicts with some of our um, recommendations on kind of trying to stay out of the sun. So let's touch a little bit about zinc. So the key role um, in, 
in zinc is it's very vital for lots of enzyme systems. So thinking back to our biochemistry, lots of nucleic acid metabolism and protein synthesis. If we have a deficiency, we can see poor growth and development. Um, and then you can see the requirements. So three milligrams per kilogram from birth to six months, five milligrams per kilogram from six months to a year, 10 for one to 10 years, and then greater than 15 for greater than 10 years old. Um, and our best sources, once again, are going to be that meat and fish. So really trying to push the meat and fish for our first complementary foods. Um, and then you can just see how much colostrum and breast milk provides. Um, okay, and th next let's talk about fluoride. So it's not something necessarily we're eating, but it's important and I, I think a lot of us don't quite know the recommendations for these, so I wanted to touch on that. So why is fluoride so important? It does promote enamel um, remineralization and reduces enamel demineralization. Um, and it also inhibits bacterial metabolism and acid production, so protecting against those dental caries. And it is recommended at six months of age, especially for those that are exclusively breastfed or are doing ready-to-feed formula, so they're not gonna be getting fluoride from any other source. Um, and then once teeth um, have emerged, we can start to do the fluoride varnish every three to six months, which we've also started doing. And the United States Public Health Service recommends an optimal community drinking water concentration of 0 0.7 milligrams per liter to prevent dental caries. So this is another area where we have potential for advocacy, because I know in this area, recently there were some questions on um, having fluoride in our water, plus or minus. Um, so really advocating for having that fluoride in there. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about this. So if you have a low risk of caries, um, which high risk of caries means that you have mom or a primary caregiver that has active caries, low socioeconomic status, or you have greater than sh three sugar-containing beverages or snacks between meals, which I think more of our kids are doing than we realize. Um, and then if the child is also put to bed with a bottle as well, then it puts them in that high risk. So toothpaste, we're gonna start once we have teeth. So from whenever we get teeth to three years old, we're gonna just do a smear of toothpaste. And I just wanted to actually show you what a smear is so you can show that to families. So you're gonna be brushing teeth from the moment we have teeth. Um, if they're low risk, and then same thing if they're high risk. So once again, doing that smear um, once we have those teeth. The fluoride varnish, we can do every um, three to six months, once again, once we have teeth. Um, so that can be starting really early on, depending on when that first tooth pops up. And then over-the-counter rinses. Um, I have not recommended one of these myself, but if they are high risk, once they're six years old or have shown that they can kind of uh, swish and spit, you can start thinking about um, having an over-the-counter mouth rinse for them. Um, once again, we just want to encourage community water fluorination for both high and low risk kids. And then you can actually think about doing dietary fluoride supplementation um, if um, you're exclusively breastfeeding greater than that six months old or using those ready-made formulas. Um, and I did want to just show, so a lot of parents will mix their formulas and things with different bottled waters. Um, so really none of them are getting anywhere close except for maybe the spring water to what we would recommend in, um, in our source, uh, water source, if we're just mixing it from the tap water. So if you need to start thinking about dietary fluoride supplementation, um, there is a schedule for that. And the big thing to remember is we do worry about having too much fluoride as well. So make sure you're considering all of the, all of the locations. So if the kid is sharing two different homes, make sure they're not getting more fluoride in one home versus the other. If they're in daycare, at school, that sort of stuff, um, make sure you're accounting for all the fluoride sources before you start thinking about actually supplementing them. Um, and initially, zero to six months, you don't have to worry about supplementing them. Um, and then you can kind of see from six months to three year, years old, depending on the community drinking water, how much you want to start thinking about um, supplementing these kids. So next I want to kind of just transition to home preparation um, of, of foods, which I think is a newer thing that a lot of families have not necessarily questions about, but they're definitely doing and you want to be able to recommend certain things for them. So a lot of families are doing it just because of them thinking it's fresher, increased variety and texture, the cost, and then avoiding preservatives as well. 
Um, and one thing to point out to these parents is if they're deciding to introduce foods really early, so younger than four months old, um, spinach, beets, green beans, squash, and carrots can all have sufficient levels of nitrates, which can cause methemoglobinemia, which we just talked about with Dr. Malkani's lecture. So um, making sure at that two-month visit we start talking to families about this if you think they're going to be leaning towards introducing foods a little bit early. Um, once again, making sure we're not buying anything that has salt added. So we want no salt added products. Some people are even making, making foods out of canned foods, so making sure that um, there's no sodium or sugar in it. Those sort of things. Once again, no unpasteurized milk or honey, um, just because of the bacteria that can be there. And then we want to use standard precautions for preparing these foods. So, you know, making sure we're washing cutting boards and not cross-contaminating those sorts of things. Um, always throwing away leftovers in a dish, so not making a huge supply for this little kid, making because you're going to have to toss it out if you're kind of reintroducing that spoon after putting it in the child's mouth. Um, and then never leaving anything, anything at room temperature for greater than two hours, which is sometimes hard. Um, and then not storing it in the fridge for greater than 24 hours if we do have a meat product, poultry, fish, or eggs. And then no more than 48 hours for fruits and vegetables. So you have a very kind of small window for those. And then never defrosting at room temperature or in water. And then um, things can only stay frozen for a month. So you have to really think ahead if you want to do do these things. Okay, so then just a few, few little hints about the feeding environment. Um, there have been th some studies that show that there is self-regulation of intake um, for infants if you follow their cues, which anyone who has an infant probably is saying that's not true, but um, if you listen to kind of when they're hungry and feed them when they're hungry and then take away those cues when they're pushing away, leaning back, that sort of stuff, they should have self-regulation of intake and won't end up taking too much, um, or they can end up taking too little if, if you're not kind of feeding off those cues and actually giving them what they need. Um, also, just making sure we think about the culture, traditional, and individual, individual preferences of families. So sometimes families will come in, if they're from a different culture or tradition, will be introducing foods that you're not quite aware of what's in them. So making sure to actually look at them so you can make some really good recommendations for them. Um, and then just realizing that feeding practices that are started in infancy will follow into later childhood and, and adulthood as well. So there's been some studies even saying doing the family dinners and lunches and that sort of stuff with your infant, even when you're first introducing food, will encourage that later on in life, um, which is scary to think about almost. <laughs> Okay, and I wanted to just conclude with this summary statement by the European Society for Pediatric Gastroenterology, Hepatology, and Nutrition Committee on Nutrition. Um, so it really summarizes the, the whole talk that I had. So infants should be offered foods with a variety of flavors and textures, including bitter tasting greens and vegetables. Um, continue breastfeeding is recommended alongside complementary foods. Whole cow's milk should not be, the, be used as the main drinking source for kids until 12 months of age. Um, allergenic foods may be introduced when complementary foods are commenced anytime after four months, um, and especially those infants at high risk of peanut allergy, like we talked about, introducing between four and 11 months um, after providing appropriate guidance. And then introducing gluten can be between four and 12 months, but consumption of large quantities should be avoided during the first weeks of introduction, um, just to see if there's a problem there. And all infants should receive iron-rich complementary foods, including meat products and or iron-fortified foods. Once again, no sugar or salt should be added to complementary foods, and fruit juices or sugar-sweetened beverages should be avoided. And vegan diets, um, which I didn't touch on, but should only be used under appropriate medical or Diet, uh, dietitian supervision and parents should understand the serious cons consequences of failing to follow advice regarding supplementation of the diet. So here's my reference. Thanks, guys. <laughs> Any questions or anything else? Okay. Uh -huh. I have yet to meet a family that has introduced it. The big thing is um, definitely doing the iron, you do iron fortified cereals, that's a more accepted one, um, but just trying to push the meats as early as you can for that, for that iron. So did I hear this correctly? Breastfed baby needs to be on vitamin D, iron, and fluoride? So it, it depends how far you go. So if they're exclusively breastfed greater than six months of age, then I would say yes. 
but you should be starting to introduce at least some complementary foods by four to six months of age. So vitamin D, 100%, yeah. Iron, once we start getting that four to six months age, you should really start encouraging some um, iron fortified cereals or some source of iron. And then if they have no other source, so they are exclusively breastfed greater than six months, you would want to think about fluoride. Yeah. 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 About yeah. Their recommendations for introducing anything other than exclusive breast mm -hmm. feeding. So, um, you know, and, and it's different for preterm in mm -hmm. terms of iron requirements. But I can tell you the section on breastfeeding, um, you know, and, and the breastfeeding recommendations um, do recommend exclusive breastfeeding mm -hmm. for approximately the first six months of life. So closer to that six yeah. months yeah. than the four months um, before you introduce food. Mm -hmm. um, of course, what you said about vitamin D, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's, it's completely consistent mm -hmm. with what everybody says. Um, but in a healthy term infant, like you said, not past six months of yeah. exclusive breastfeeding, you don't need iron, mm -hmm. at least according to some section. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of conflicting even between the AAP. The who says definitely exclusive breastfeeding for six months. Parents, but just the reason why exclusive breastfeeding is recommended for approximately six months is there's thousands of research studies that show mm -hmm. a dose response relationship between the dose of breast milk and all these different infant health outcomes, mm -hmm. you know, including SIDS. And so that's why there's that conflict, you know. Yeah. Makes it Things hard. It's always changed. I yeah. have a question, though. Yeah. About fluoride, because when I practice in California, we mm -hmm. do get fluoride prescriptions routinely because the water was fluoridated. Mm -hmm. And um, here, I, I was just curious for other primary care doctors if they get those out very much. You know, I've had families, and I don't see outpatients, but they <laughs> have well water. Mm -hmm. And I think it's recommended to test it. Mm -hmm. But I don't think any of my families have followed that recommendation. No. <laughs> And um, I was just curious if anybody um, has decided to pre prescribe fluoride, because I think so far I've kind of erred on the side of caution, mm -hmm. recommended give your child some drinking water with, with fluoride. Yeah. I was just curious if anybody had another approach to that, since all our community water is fluoridated. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. Uh, I, you know. Do you have a fluoride comment? Fluoride recommendations changed yeah. some years ago. You know, before then, I was more likely to write fluoride Now we have the varnish a little bit more readily available to you. Like the wick office just varnishes everyone, so. And then we do too, so. <laughs> Which are great. Yeah. I actually had a question slash comment. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you. I'm talking to you about the breastfed infants, Dr. Bakani's question, and Dr. Sinina's comment. What I do think about in the general pediatrician is to actually check the CDC early on those things. Mm -hmm. And so I don't wait till the 12 month mark to check the CDC. Yeah. I always try to check it in nine months. Mm -hmm. Because invariably they are or start to be mm -hmm. deficient, no matter how many complementary foods they start at that six month mark. And oftentimes the amount of iron in the breast milk is reflective of mom's score, which may be low to start off with, depending on which pregnancy it was and all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. And um, in your CBC, you don't need to wait till they're iron deficient. You can look to see yeah. if they're microcytic and, and start supplementing them. Mm -hmm. That's the one change I've made, and I found it makes a difference on regular babies. I always check my 
if I know that the grass is going to be six months of age, mm -hmm. I still check it at nine months yeah. because I know that and I've found oftentimes that they think they're already deficient or they're supposed to be deficient. The child needs whether they have eczema or not after you're introducing peanuts. Mm -hmm. How often are you then kind of continuing them? Is it weekly? Is it yeah, so they want to do three times a week um, at least six grams of peanuts, which is what the LEAP study showed. So they they based it right off of, took the exact study design, everything from the LEAP study to make those recommendations on those kids that are the egg allergy or severe eczema. So introducing as early as possible, definitely between that 4 to 11 mark, and then doing six grams at least three times a week. Yeah. Anyone else? Thanks, guys.